Hey, uh, I've been on sabbatical, so uh, it's, uh, it's going to be rough. Um, no, I, I had a great time. It's good to be back in the house of God with all of you. And, uh, you know, um, listen, it's good to see the building still here. That's nice. And uh, most of you still love God. That's a good bonus, too. So um, we're starting a new series. I want to tell you something, though. Coming out of this sabbatical, I have a more intense desire than ever before to see you understand and walk in the life that God has called you to. And that this is, and you want to know that life? That life is to be continually transformed more and more to look and act and think like Jesus more and more and more in your life. Hey, say amen if you believe that, okay? In fact, I'll say it this way. It is not enough to say I am a Christian. We have to be disciples of Christ, disciples of Jesus. So you'll hear a lot about that uh, probably in this series over the summer. We're going to try and dive into this Gospel of Matthew, and uh, it is written by the disciple Matthew, which makes sense. He also was known as Levi. He was a tax collector, and uh, Jesus did an amazing work in his life. And uh, okay, you can follow along with us every day on your phone. Listen, we are doing uh, devos, devotionals, and uh, if you take a picture of this screen right here on your phone... And you can go back and sign up for that if you haven't already. Some of you, how many are getting those devotionals? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah. We did this for a whole year, about a couple of years ago maybe, I don't know. And uh, we're going to do this throughout the summer where we're following along, we're diving into the book of Matthew. And on these devotionals, we're going to go line by line. We're just going through the book, okay? So I think it's going to help you. Uh, we're going to study here and in the de devotionals, we're going to study some of Christ's encounters with people. That's eye-opening. You can learn a lot about uh, him. Uh, you can learn about his miracles. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the things that he said that freaked people out. Even now, he still freaks people out. Some of the stuff we read, we're like, did he really say that? And then we might, God willing, get to, uh, get to his talks on the end times. You know, a lot of people have their theories, but what really matters is what Jesus said about it. Okay, so listen, in order to be a disciple of Christ, y'all follow me here for a second, I think it's kind of important that you know what he was like, right? That you study him, you study his life, you, you see what he likes and what he doesn't like, what he's asking us to do, what he's asking us not to do. Y'all still here? How he thinks, how he says we should think. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump to the end of the book. I know we're going to start at the beginning. We're about to jump into the beginning. But I want to start at the end of the book and that is the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples before he went to heaven, uh, back up to heaven, okay, the ascension, it's called. And Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says this. This is Jesus. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach all these disciples, he's saying, to obey everything I've commanded you. And even gives us this promise. And look, I'm going to be with you even to the end of the age. This is what we call the Great Commission. It's not the great suggestion, the great idea. It is the Great Commission because he's commissioned us to do what he told us to do. Okay? So what is he telling us to do? Make disciples. Right? To obey everything. that, that He's saying make disciples and have them obey everything I commanded. All right, so there's a big presupposition in that statement that we ourselves are disciples of Christ and that we are obeying his word. Y'all still here this morning? Okay, so, so what, then what did he teach us? What did he teach us? Well, he taught us this, to love God with all of our heart. He actually showed us how to do that, all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, and then he also taught us to love other people as well. Isn't that right? I, I, I like the way that Pastor Rick Bazette says it, and I think he mentioned it when he was here a few weeks ago. He says, listen, our church, our church must continue in the love of God. we got to keep loving God like never before. How do you do that? By holding on to his word, by, by honoring his word, by obeying his word. Amen? And also, keep loving people with radical love. So we've got strong, unmovable convictions, and then we're going to love people radically. Can I just say something to you? I just want to take a little side teaching here. I just want to tell you that if, if, if you're aiming your life at that and you're trying to get good at those two things with, with the grace of God, you're going to earn yourself some haters. 
<laughs> Some of y'all are like, what are you talking about? Oh, yes, believe me, Jesus said it himself, increasingly the world is going to hate you because of me. Have you figured out we're living in that time yet? <laughs> uh, and he didn't just say outside the church, he even said in the church. Watch out, because Jesus said the love of most will grow cold. Now, I hate the word most because it means more than 50%. But you know, he was talking about the people of God. So beware. Y'all look at me, church. Be aware and beware that you don't fall into that. Don't get caught up in all this stuff. And, and, and many of you know this. Listen, you know that increasingly so we're going to see these kind of attacks. Uh, you can see it more and more attacks are ramping up against you, us, our faith, our beliefs, um, especially in the arena of social media Oh, my goodness, all right? Because the enemy hates what's going on. That's why. And, and so here's the thing. Uh, we continue to get hit as a church. You do as well as a Christian family. Um, even more so now, though, because of our convictions on, on our biblical definition of marriage, which is between a man and a woman, uh, biblical definition of sexuality, which we're going to continue to support, and even our pro-life stance against abortion, all of these things, okay? Listen, as I'm even talking about this, some of you here might disagree. Can I tell you something? You're still welcome here, and we're going to love you with all the grace of God on board, okay? However, we're never going to stop teaching the truth of God's word. We're going to continue to love his convictions and continue to teach that, even though we know that hatred is going to get thrown our way continually, lies, all these things, okay? Are y'all still here? And we are called to be disciples of Christ. And so that is what I'm hoping. Listen, I'm hoping that this study in the book of Matthew is going to help you so much because you're going to actually know Christ. Like, this is what my life should look like. Amen? So back to this book of Matthew. Look, the first 17 verses in this book. All right, so I want you all to grab your paper. You see your paper? Your newspaper? We, we've printed the good news for you. Now, open it up. The first page there. Now, look, first 17 verses. I know I can't read it. My arms aren't long enough. I cannot see that paper. It's too small. But our creative department knocked it out of the park with this thing. Seriously, this is really cool. We've got some advertisements there for you. Um, I, I, I probably shouldn't have had you pick that up because now you're going to be looking through it the whole time. But the first 17 verses in this book, okay, are the most neglected chunk of Scripture in the entire Bible. Y'all know it's the genealogy of Jesus that you always skip over, right? It's like that junk drawer, that closet you never look in. It's neglected. You don't want to go in there. <laughs> Y'all know you have those in your house. And, and here's the thing, because it's the genealogy of Jesus, and uh, I, I don't think I've ever preached on this. Even worse, man, in my reading time, I tend to just see a bunch of names then say, and Jesus was born, you know? And uh, look, here's the truth about the Bible, though. Y'all look at me. All of it is useful. All of it is food for our souls, man. You know, some food, some food doesn't look that good, but man, it tastes amazing. I was thinking about like guacamole. You know, I never, I never ate guacamole, but Kamani turned me on to this stuff. And I didn't like it because, I mean, it looks like baby food or, or something worse from a baby, you know? And I, I'm like, that looks awful, but man, it is so good. Am I right? All right, so the genealogy of Matthew is a lot like guacamole. I mean, you look at it, you're like, meh, it's not that. But, man, there's so much in there, and it's packed with wisdom, and it's, it just really packs a punch. So I'm going to read through this. Uh, I'm going to try anyway if I can make it. But this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. This is verse 1. The son of David, the son of Abraham. I think it's very interesting that Matthew starts off that way. Okay, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. You guys probably all know those folks. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose name, or rather whose mother was Tamar. That whole story right there is something off of Jerry Springer. I'm not kidding you. You know, look at that. There's so much in here. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amenadab. Man, that is hard to say. And that dude was the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, I'm going to come back to that woman at the end because you need to learn from her story. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. She's got her own book. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. 
We know her as Bathsheba. So much interesting stuff in here. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Time out. Ahaz could have earned the title the worst king in Judah's history. Okay. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. He wasn't too great either, but he had a good ending. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. And after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Beverly was trying to help me pronounce this earlier. I'm just going to call him Sheely. Because old Sheely had Zerubbabel. If you don't have anything else to be thankful for this morning, (laughs) thank God your mom didn't name you Zerubbabel. (laughs) Somebody was like, oh. (laughs) Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar who was the father of Matan, who was the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Verse 17, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and then 14 from the exile to the Messiah. If you don't think that's significant, you're wrong. And I just want to give you a few reasons why Matthew included all these names, okay, at the beginning of his gospel. And you should remember these. First of all, write this down. The life of Jesus is a historical fact. That's the first thing we learn. Look, for the Jews, by the way, this list, their list of where they came from, this was like their birth certificate for them. And it proved to everybody, see, Jesus had one. And it proved to everyone in the world that Jesus was legitimate, like he was a real person in history. Amen? And there's so many prophecies that are fulfilled. As I was reading, I was just mentioning a few stories, but there's so many things that are fulfilled from Old Testament prophecy on in this genealogy. But also a few things that it shows us, y'all listen to this, is that Christianity is not just some startup religion in Bethlehem on. No, it shows us that it actually, Christianity is the fulfillment and the purpose of God on the earth ever since the beginning of time, all throughout history. This is what God has been working on, and you see it in the genealogy of Jesus. There's a couple other things to note here that that I love. Note this, that there, there are five women in this genealogy. Now, that was unheard of for Jews to write all that down. Okay, but notice that Matthew, who, by the way, this was written in Greek, but it was written primarily to Jewish believers, But he includes five women, and I think this is funny because here's why. If you know a little bit about the religious people in the day of Jesus, Pharisees and the like, they they wake up every day and thank God for two things. Ready? Number one, thank God I'm not a Gentile. Thank God I'm not a woman. That's literally what they would do. Okay, so here's the great thing. Matthew writes women and Gentiles into the genealogy. And I think it's so great, which also leads us to this, that there are, there are many different ethnicities in this genealogy, not just Jewish people. Okay, you've got Moab, a Moabite in there. You've got a Canaanite. That's not a great, <laughs> it's not a great heritage, right? You got, so what do you have here? Essentially, you've got Jesus is, is mixed. You got black and brown people all up in this genealogy, okay? And I love it because here's what it does. It destroys this teaching that there's this superior race and inferior race. Y'all look at me. If you're a Christ follower, a born-again believer, there's only one race, the human race, and you're part of a beautiful family, okay? The family of God. And that's what heaven's going to look like, okay? And also, you need to know this. You have roots, strong spiritual roots, okay? So interesting to me that when Jesus, this is toward the end of the book, but when Jesus is standing before Pilate, do you remember this? Pilate's wife, was she runs up to her husband and says, you need to be very careful how you deal with this man. She was troubled in her dreams all night about Jesus. 
And so Pilate looks at Jesus, and he doesn't, he doesn't ask him, like, what did you do wrong? Like, what did you do? No, what does he ask him? He says, where are you from? Isn't that interesting? Where are you from? And I think that this, in the, in the very beginning of Matthew, Matthew is writing this for us. He's answering Pilate's question at the beginning of the book. This is where he's from. And, you know, today I was thinking about how we're, we're, we're a people, really, that a lot of times we don't really know our roots. You know, we don't know past maybe three generations. But there's really an intense desire. A lot of people want to know where they're from these days. That's why you see things like Ancestry.com. You know what I'm talking about? You can figure out who your people were, right? 23 and Me, you can spit in a cup and solve the mystery, you know? Like, where am I from? There you go. Okay. A friend this week and I were talking about, he showed me this amazing book. He has these memoirs from his dad from his time. He grew up in Latvia as a child. And during the time of Russia's takeover and, and Hitler's time, it's fascinating. They're moved to America. And I was thinking about how my mom had a book kind of like that. Uh, I, I don't know if I can find it anymore, but I remember seeing it. And it was mostly photos. And it had like descriptions of people of, of generations before in her family. And I remember, I think it was my great-grandfather, I'm pretty sure, had his picture there, and, and this is what it said. He was a big man. <laughs> like, that's what he was known for, you know? And then something else about whiskey. But, but, uh, but for you, <laughs> I can't remember. But for those of you who are in Christ, y'all look at me, y'all look at me. You have roots, and you actually have a part to play in this family tree. You're invested in it, okay? You've helped develop it. Develop it. And, and spiritually, you've got to understand your roots. Okay, Galatians chapter 3. You need to go look at this, all right? Verse 26 through 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. In fact, other part of the, uh, the, the New Testament talks about being grafted in, okay, to the people of God. And, and verse 27 and 28 goes on and talks about how, look, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile anymore, if you're in Christ. It doesn't matter, male or female, it doesn't matter. Hey, slave or free person, it doesn't matter. Look at verse 29. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, you. You see what he's saying? Not just the Jews anymore. And you are heirs according to the promise man, suddenly some of you got real interested in the Old Testament. <laughs> like, wait, what's mine? <laughs> you know, start looking at that stuff, okay? Second thing this shows us, this genealogy, though, is that God uses people who are less than ideal. Somebody needs to say amen to that. Listen, if you, I don't have time to go through all this. I pointed out a little bit of it. But if you look at the characters in this genealogy, man, I'm telling you, oh, there's some characters, there's prostitutes in this list, okay? Uh, adulterers, people who worshiped idols, other gods. Here's a question. You ever had anybody in your family that embarrassed you? If they're sitting next to you, don't make a move, don't look suspicious, okay? You ever had a cousin, a cousin that you were ashamed, man? You're like, man, I cannot believe I'm related to that guy, right? Or that aunt that always showed up at your ball game, and she just like, come on, we really wish you weren't here, you know? I found out, listen, in South Louisiana, you're going to love this. It's just, if, if you're a Cajun, it's just in your bloodline, all this stuff. And it explains a lot because, uh, you know, in, in Louisiana, when the French were, were, were there, they, uh, they basically ran out of women. I, I, read, I read about this the other day. They ran out of women who were willing to, to live on the bayou. So the leader of Louisiana at that time, he uh, wrote back to the king of France and asked if he could send women who were, who were willing to, to marry the men there and live in South Louisiana, and, uh, and the king of France obliged. He, he, he emptied out the women's prisons and sent them to South Louisiana. <laughs> Y'all, that's how Boudreaux and Thibodeau came to be. I know this is starting to make a lot of sense to all you guys now. Really, it is. But, you know, you look at the Savior, the Savior of the world, and you think, man, he'd have a much better-looking family tree than this. But here's the point, guys. Y'all look at me. If you are in Christ, your family dynamics cannot, cannot, cannot limit you unless you allow it. Because you're in a new family tree. You're in a redeemed family tree. 
okay? And uh, don't fall into that victim-type mentality. I hate it. Like, man, if only my parents were better people, you know, if they had a little more money, if they didn't hang around with such losers, you know, all, all this, then I, I, would, I would have a, half a chance to have a good life. No, no, don't do that. Listen, you look at Jesus' family tree. If you want to encourage yourself, again, you had people that started well in his family tree, and they flamed out. Some of these kings, I just went through them pretty quickly. Some of them were bad, bad dudes. And some of these people had mental issues. Some of them had character issues. Some were straight up demonic. She had sex workers in there. Murders. I mentioned Ahaz. Let me tell you what he did. He basically, this guy went through a list of everything God said not to do. And he made a practice of it. Okay. And we're laughing, but you know, he even burned his son alive. I mean, like offered him as a human sacrifice. And this guy is a relative of Jesus. So I'm just trying to give you some hope. Look, all of the curses and all the wrong influences were broken at Calvary. All of them. So if you sit here and you feel like, wow, I'm limited, I'm bound by poverty, I'm bound to some sin that's been in my family, my heredity, my heredity, listen, then you don't understand the freedom you have of being in the tree that is the family of Jesus. You don't understand it, and you need a revelation of that, okay? So here's what I say, go start a new legacy based on Jesus, rooted in Jesus, right? He is the branch and we are the vines, Amen. If we stay in him and his words remain in us, two big ifs. But if that's the case, then we're going to go and produce much fruit. Isn't that great? We're going to do what God's called us to do. Hey, I was telling somebody this week that I had a great childhood. Like a lot of you had a great childhood. But I missed a few components, like like affection. And so like we, we, my family grew up, we never, hardly ever told each other. We loved each other, none of that. So here's what Kamani and I, with the grace of God helping us, we have changed the culture of our family. And so we tell each other, I love you almost all the time now. Look, granted, sometimes we don't act like it. Okay, I get it. But that's not the point. The point is, we started a new legacy based and rooted in Jesus. And that's what you can do too, okay? Also, here's something else you can do. If you have a bunch of misfits and embarrassments in your family, maybe you're the misfit. I don't know. Here's the thing. You know what you do? You can use that. You learn to love people. Jesus came from a family of sinners, and he learned to be a friend of sinners. Are y'all still here? Here's the third thing. And this is the one I really want to, I want you to take some time on, okay? And we're going to have some time to respond and let, let the Holy Spirit do what he wants in our lives. But write this down. God is still restoring people. This genealogy, it shows this to us. There are many, many stories that we could point to. But I wanted to key on this, this woman, Rahab, the prostitute. Now, listen, if you're a young person in here and you're like, what is a prostitute? Well, you know what you can do? Go talk to your mom and dad about that. You can, in fact, you can use that as a discussion starter at lunch today. Y'all go ahead and talk about that. <laughs> you're welcome. So Rahab, the prostitute, first of all, she's all over the Bible. You know that? You see her in several places. You see her in the Old Testament and the New She's in the historical books. Joshua, that book is where you really see her whole story. But she's, she's also in, in wisdom books. She's in genealogies like the one we just read. She also shows up in the Hall of Faith over in Hebrews. Oh, yes, listed with people like Abraham. Okay, and here's why she's everywhere. Y'all listen to me. Because her story is meant to be a picture of all of our story. See, Rahab, the prostitute, she was a prostitute in Jericho, and she had a brothel built into the wall of Jericho. Now, when the Israelites showed up, and they were checking out, they were spying. They sent two spies into Jericho. To, to, they were going to destroy Jericho, and they were checking it out. And these two spies, they got found out. And Rahab had some kind of a divine revelation. She, she, she put her faith in God. She knew, she knew and confessed that the God of Israel is God. And she helped those two Israelite spies escape. And then, this is so cool. All right, by the way, helping men escape or helping men hide, I'm sure she probably thought, this isn't my first rodeo hiding two men in the brothel. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is something she's probably used to. I don't know. That's not in the Bible, by the way. But when the Israelites marched out around Jericho, here's, here's something that's amazing you may have never thought about. She puts this red cord. Y'all remember that? A crimson-colored cord out of her window over her home 
And that's, that represents two things. First of all, it was a picture of what the blood of Jesus was going to do for us. It was going to save us from our sins. The other thing, though, it was a prophetic image of her bloodline. Like a legacy was going to come from this family, from this bloodline. Man, what a legacy. But you see, when, when the walls of Jericho came down and everything was destroyed, the whole wall collapsed except not at her house. What a picture, right, of God's grace. And what a legacy this woman has. Man, I'll tell you this. I was thinking about this question. What should you do after you receive saving grace? Well, Rahab gives us a great picture of that. Don't miss this. Y'all look at me. You start walking with a new family is what you do. Because you read, this genealogy shows it, right? This is exactly what Rahab did. She pulled up stakes. She said, I'm not that anymore. She made some new relationships in the people of God. And in, in fact, one day she met this guy, Salmon. Salmon. I want to I want to call him Salmon all the time. But his name's Salmon, I'm sure, okay? But these people, she, he was an Israelite. Remember, she's a Canaanite. They fell in love. I'm telling you, Hallmark movies, they can't come up with anything better than this, right? And Salmon knew everything about this woman because he was there. He knew everything about her. And still he loved her. Yet again, a picture of God's love for us, right? It's a picture of God's love. And then they, had, they got married. They had a son named Boaz. We already, we already showed this. He, who had a son named Obed. Who had a son named Jesse. Who had a son named David. Man, do y'all see how amazing God is? So you get some saving grace. You start walking with the people of God. The church. I'm telling you what God's going to do in your life. You're going to start seeing his will coming to fruition. Let, let, me, let me stop here and say something. Please note this right now. The grace of God is not just for the forgiveness of your sin. It is. But it's not just to make you right with God. The grace of God and the blood of Jesus doesn't just make you right with God. Listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. It's so that you have the power to transform your life. And, and listen, if you, th- if you look at the grace of God, like all you see is a get out of jail free card, you're missing the best part. You're missing Romans 12 too, right? Don't be conformed anymore to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Be transformed. By what? By letting God change the way you think. And you're missing out on the fact that Paul said, hey, put off the old daily. Put on the new. Put on the new. And then, and then you're missing out on the best. Look, the purpose of God in your life, the purity, the power he wants to give you every day. See, this is what Rahab discovered. Salmon and Rahab, then they had little Boaz, right? They, they settled down, and Salmon started building this little village. It became known as Bethlehem. Think about this. This is the place where Jesus would be born. I am telling you, you receive saving grace from the Lord. Start walking with a new family. Get your spiritual roots. Daily, you're allowing him to change you. You're putting forth the effort. He's meeting you there with his grace. You're being sanctified daily. Listen to me. It is amazing. Look, if God can take this mess of a family line, all right, and produce the Messiah. If God can take the trash that was just the trashy situations that we were looking at and turn it into treasure, can you imagine what he's going to do in your life? Think about it. This is what this genealogy is telling you. He wants to do something new. He wants to do something holy. He wants his will to happen in your life. Amen? I told you we're going to let you guys have some time to to let the Lord do whatever he wants, okay? But right now, I want you to close your eyes, bow your heads. I just want to pray for you. Because some of you here, man, you, you need to do what Rahab did. Respond to the revelation of who Jesus is, the fact that he wants you in his family. But respond like Rahab did. Confess him as Lord and Savior. But man, pick up, 
your stakes and make a new family. Just begin a new legacy. Jesus wants to write a new story in you. If you're here and you're far from God, or maybe you grew up around some of these things and these ideas, but you know Jesus is not your Savior. Listen, Paul said this. You, you'll know if you're in the faith. He said, examine yourselves. Don't you know? You're going to know if you're in the faith. If you don't, then you're probably not. So I need you to examine yourself. This is serious business. If you're far from God, you do not have the saving grace of the Lord in your life. Then you can be forgiven today. But as I mentioned earlier, it's way more than that. You can start your journey of sanctification, of regeneration, becoming a new person every day, looking more and more like Christ. If that's you and you say, I want, I want in on that today, Raise your hand all around this room. I'm not going to call you to the front, but you're going to get you're going to you're going to do some business with heaven right now, okay? Come on, raise your hand. Don't be ashamed in this sinful generation. Don't be ashamed of God. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Raise your hand toward heaven, okay? All right, you can put your hands down. If that was you, just pray something like this. Lord, forgive me. Come on, just tell him, Lord, forgive me. In fact, could everybody in this room just say, "Lord, forgive me for doing my life without you. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I want to be in your family. Change my life. I now live in you and for you. And help me to do that, do that every day. Come on, just tell him. Come on, just tell God. Help me do that every day. And just thank him now. Thank him. Lord, I pray for every person in this room, Lord, who calls on your name with a sincere heart. Lord, you meet them where they're at, right in the middle of whatever they're in, God. A great life or a terrible life. And you change them forever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.